Hi. Uh, welcome tonight. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, this is a very, very special evening. I'm not going to walk in circles the whole time, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> um, uh, I feel so honored to be here speaking with all of you and introducing my very dear friend, Priya Parker. Uh, Priya has been um, not only a close friend, but someone I think of as a teacher in my life. Uh, she's one of those people who moves her friends to have those vulnerable, honest conversations that often bring people closer together, but so, so rarely we actually have. Um, little did I know, though, in the beginning of our friendship that Priya was also a total badass, incredible, amazing woman out in the world um, working in conflict resolution. Not often a field women um, are welcomed in, but Priya not only worked in it, she dominates it. Uh, she would, in between dinners and uh, visits with her, she'd go off into the world and come back telling about times in India where she was working to uh, repair relationships between Hindus and Muslims, traveling to the Middle East to work on Arab, European, and American relationships. Here in the U.S., she's a trusted advisor to some of our most important political and social activists uh, working on race relations. That, those are just some of the typical days Priya has. Uh, she does it by thinking about the power and dynamics of groups every single day. She shows it to us, uh, her friends, and shortly to all of you, um, in wonderful, gracious, gentle ways. Um, one of the things that I love the most about Priya is the way that she fa forces you into facing something about yourself that you might not know. Um, I often feel like I've learned so much from her just by being her friend, but when I got this book, I found that I still had so many lessons to learn from Priya. This book, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, is an incredible adventure, um, really de diving deep into the stories of over a hundred gatherers. Priya, not just relying on her own wisdom, looked at uh, Dolly, uh, not Dolly, <laughs> uh, not Dolly the painter, um, uh, Zen Buddhist, um, dominatrix, uh, <laughs> rabbis, uh, now I'm forgetting all of the other ones, but there are, there's hundreds of them in there, I'm sorry. Let me think about this. Who else was in there on it? Cirque, Cirque de Soleil, Soleil choreographers. Um, she interviewed all of those, took, t took all of their lessons, and put together a book that is really a manual, not just for how to live, but also how to work, how to gather people, how to bring people more closely together. Um, and tonight, instead of doing a traditional book reading, we really pushed Priya to think about teaching some of those lessons to all of us by showing uh, what she is capable of. So tonight, instead of a traditional event at the Strand, we wanted to introduce Priya to show us a mini masterclass in how to bring people together and to participate in an act of gathering. Priya Parker, please join us. This is starting to feel like a wedding rather than a book launch. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, and it's the honor of my life to be here at the Strand with all of you in the room. Um, and the biggest thing, whenever I see all of you who love me and who I love you, my biggest thing is to not cry, but I will probably cry many times tonight. What I wanted to do with you is to create an experience, um, a little mini version of a masterclass that I do with clients and with communities, um, sometimes with my friends when they're, when they're willing, and basically create a gathering among us, because the people in this room are spectacular. And I wrote this book to help people in all of the parts of their life activate the people around you, and to not go to any more meetings or conferences or even weddings and even funerals um, when, when the potential among the people that could be tapped into um, is missed. And so with that, and with your permission, um, I'd like to basically start by weaving community together with, with all of you. And um, a, a few things. First, we are Facebook living it, but I've asked that this part is off so that you can um, participate fully and be present in the room. Um, the second is uh, to, to participate in the ways that you want. Um, and so I'm going to be doing a lot of different things, and all I ask of you um, is to be fully present 
and to judge later. Because you can't be present and judge at the same time. It's very difficult. You can toggle back and forth between the two. Um, but judge all of this later. Think, what happened? What did I think of that? Can I do that? Do I want to do that? Was that strange? But do it at 8 o'clock, not at 7.15. Um, and finally, uh, to enjoy and to think about what you are like when you are in a gathering, whether a guest or host. So we'll begin. So I invite you to put down your stuff and stand up. <laughs> the tight space. I'm going to stand in the middle. And um, if you're comfortable, to put your hands down by your side and take a couple of deep breaths. And, uh, and if it's available to you, to close your eyes, look down on the floor, and just kind of breathe for a few seconds. You're all coming from work or different places, uh, dropping children off. Many of you got babysitters, which I'm so grateful for. You can stop there. Your, your kids are with your babysitters. So you don't have to worry about them. And just take a couple of deep breaths. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And actually physically ground your feet. So actually feel the floor. Studies show that 80 to 90% of the um, information that the brain receives about movement and space comes from the nerve endings on the soles of the feet. So you're literally grounding as you step into the floor. And as you do, to begin to open your eyes, to look up, and invite you to actually just look around and see who is here. And notice as, as you do, if you're still breathing or if you're holding your breath, and take a couple of more breaths. And if you dare make eye contact with people, you can acknowledge them. Many of you are old friends. Some of you are new. And as you do, and as you feel this sort of tingly or nervousness, slight awkwardness, this awkwardness is the life of groups. And this awkwardness is why we tend to overfocus on flowers and table settings and food and focus all of our anxiety on the things that actually don't create magic. And so the more you can hold the slight discomfort when you're in a group situation, the more you will be able to take collective risks together. So continue to breathe, and as you do, you can sit back down. And I'm just going to read a few prompts. And if it's true for you, I um, invite you to just stand. If this is your first time at the Strand, stand up. Welcome. Where have you been? <laughs> and you sit back down. If you consider the Strand your second home. <laughs> Gilda, thank you. <laughs> If you consider yourself a New Yorker, and just look around, how many of you, uh, if you arrived within the last five years, sit down? Wow. So you're the real deal. <laughs> if you arrived within the last decade, you can sit down. If you arrived 20 years ago or less, don't worry, it still counts. <laughs> if you arrived 40 years ago or less, beautiful. And um, if you were born here, stay standing, beautiful. And um, I just want to go around very quickly and I just ask your, your name and which hospital you were born in. <laughs> and so if you were also born at NYU Langone, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, NYU, okay. And a few others. So Charles, you were born in NYU. Darshan uh, Chitrapanu, I was born in a doctor's hospital which I think is uh, Beth Israel. Kathy Del Gercio, St. Vincent's. Albert Einstein, the boogie down Bronx. <laughs> I'm Bruce Milner, I was born in uh, Maimonides or Brooklyn Jewish. 
So thank you. One of the things as you listen, you can sit down. One of the things that is interesting to me is the number of institutions that are still exist in New York, but also that have had name changes. And, and all of the reasons why institutions change their names or add their names or subtract their names. And if you want to know why, you should read my husband's book coming out in August <laughs> <laughs> called Winners Take All. <laughs> If you were born outside of the United States, stand up. And I just want to hear from a few of you, your name and the city you were born in. Stephanie Louise, and I was born in Paris. I'm from Mumbai. I'm from Mumbai. Perfect. And just speak up. Let's get a few in the back. Where were you born? And your name? Lisa, I'm born in Mumbai. I'm Brian Ali. I was born in Mumbai. And Brian. And, uh, <laughs> and Deepa is my mother. <laughs> um, and you can sit down. If you came tonight, I don't know if this is an edgy question or not, Esther can tell us. If you came tonight with someone you love, you can stand up. <laughs> And I just want to hear from a few of you, those of you who are still sitting, or if one sat and the other stood, you can talk to Esther afterwards. <laughs> and um, who did you come with and who do you love? Hi, I am Tu Daruvala. This is my wife, Hira. And we came, well, we came separately, but we're here together. <laughs> I came with my husband, but I think both of us came because we love Shyam and all the family. So that's an additional one. Thank you. Thank you. And let's do it over here. I came with my friends who are also my colleagues. And, and to be, and this is, is this your row? Good thing, it would be really awkward if only one of you were sitting down. Okay, thank you. If you consider yourself a writer, stand up. <laughs> Beautiful, and just look around. So these are the people who love words and language and think deeply about how words create reality. And someone's standing in the back also. And tell us what you write. Oh, I love that. Okay, everybody join the joy list. <laughs> and what do you write? Uh, I write speeches. And I have my first publication entirely unrelated to speeches coming out in September. And it's called? Everything is Easy. Oh, okay. And let's do one more. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Kelly Harding, and I'm working on my first nonfiction book proposal about hidden factors that influence our health. It's all the things in our neighborhoods, our relationships, our community. And um, I'm really excited to be here. And Kelly was part of my writing group. Um, so you can sit down. If you consider yourself a scientist, stand. <laughs> a reluctant scientist? <laughs> you, your interpretation. OK. Um, and you can sit back down. If you consider yourself a troublemaker. <laughs> And look around. <laughs> and um, I, I will say a couple of things. If you consider yourself a troublemaker and didn't stand, raise your hand. <laughs> Those are the real troublemakers. <laughs> um, OK, you can sit back down. If you consider yourself a smoother over, a smoother over, somebody who smooths things over, Beautiful. And you can sit back down. If you stood for both prompts, <laughs> all the agents in the room stood up. <laughs> so these are the people, as you look around, stay standing, stay standing. This is the smoother overs and the troublemakers. I always say this in systems and families, in a national conversation. These are the people that can have transformative conversations because they're willing to both provoke and they're also willing to heal. You can sit down. If you worry about the state of your country, 
if you're currently worried about the state of your country. Okay. Whichever one it is, okay? And you can s sit back down. If you're currently worried about the current state of the dishes in your sink, you can stand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you know more than 10 people in the room, if you know more than 10 people in the room, <laughs> nine is okay. <laughs> okay? S and you can sit back down. Um, if you don't know anyone in the room, welcome. <laughs> If you're related to me, by blood or choice, you can stand up. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and how are you related to me? I'm Priya's father-in-law. I met you with your boyfriend and then defeated him. <laughs> I am your, we're figuring out the terminology. I think it would be your step, step brother-in-law. Is that right? You can ask your step. <laughs> I think she validated, she validated. Um, if you've ever felt, uh, if, uh, sorry, if you had a falling out with any friends or family members after the 2016 election. If you've had a falling out with a family member or a friend because of the 2016 election. Okay. Thank you. If you are not on social media. Um, if you grew up with institutionalized religion. If you grew up with institutionalized religion. So, so these are the people um, who, depend, no matter what your relationship is to it now, grew up in the world of ritual. And whatever the ritual is, whether it's Jewish or Islam or Christianity or Orthodox, you know, of anything, these are the people who, when you actually stop and take a step back and look at the way you were raised, you can learn a lot from the institutionalized rituals and transform your gatherings based on how Organized religions gather. Um, okay, sit back down. And um, finally, if you believe in the possibility of life beyond this planet. So if I had asked this question, thank you, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or in 10 years, the numbers will change. And part of, a, part of a gathering is that people are always changing their sense of beliefs, but also a group depends and, and kind of shapes one another based on it. So I could ask this question and many other questions over the course of the next 10 years and different people would stand up. So I want to actually thank you. You can sit back down. I now want to open the floor to you. What would you like to ask of each other? What would you like to know of the people in this room? If you've ever been arrested, if, you, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to admit to being arrested, and if you'd like to share your, the story of being arrested, you can stay standing. Sure. Tell us your name. Uh, my name is Boris, and I was arrested in Nancy Pelosi's office when I was, uh, I'm sorry, I was arrested in Nancy Pelosi's office when I was uh, protesting some of the stuff that she had not been doing as the then Speaker of the House. Thank you. Anyone else? I was in Madison Square Park on my way to get a massage at my gym and I was smoking pot and I was taken to the 13th precinct, processed, spent the night in the tombs, spent $1,400 on a lawyer to get me out and it kind of changed my life and I thought it was pretty stupid and I was with a vice president from CSFB, it was a nightmare and I went to the tombs, it was no one should have to go through this. And I had a perspective which in more than 10 years later, I look at it as a blessing to just have a greater perspective and empathy for people who have to go through the criminal system. 
Okay, what else would you like to ask of each other? Yes. Tell us your name and your question. Uh, my name is Bilal, and my question is, who is still trying to figure things out? Do you have a follow-up question? <laughs> uh, you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, uh, two more questions. You can ask anything. Yes, Emma. I'm Emma, and I'd like to know who is in a job or occupation that they truly love? Wow. <laughs> follow-up question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Did you always know? What did you find this early on? So if you found it early if you found it early on, stay standing. Early on is what? By the time you were thirty six. Asking for a friend. <laughs> okay, wonderful. And then last question. You can ask this group anything. You can pull them, you can yes, please. Um, if you purchased something in the last week that you knew you didn't need, but you bought it anyway. If you purchased something in the last week that you knew you didn't need, but you bought it anyway. Okay. Any follow-up question? Was it fast fashion? <laughs> Was it fast fashion? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll uh, end with this question, and we're going to go to a conversation. If you think you know the meaning of life, if you think you know the people, the meaning of life. Okay. So I just want to quickly go around, and I'd like you to share your perspective. Uh, my name is Ida. Just because I know it doesn't mean I can articulate it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's the meaning of life. Um, so Ida is one of my favorite, favorite characters in the book. Ida is a, an unbelievably um, masterful experience designer. Um, she, her graduate work is on patterns of transformation, and she, more than anybody I know, has taught me about how to hold risk in a group and how to think about it in a, in a codified way. So follow her, follow her, follow her. Um, a few more here. Hi, um, my name's Barbara, and I think that we are here to understand that we are all the same and to connect with one another. Meaning is how you put all of the things, people, things that matter to you, your values, your priorities together in the most meaningful way. And if you do it well, then success or failure doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Now, if you enjoyed that, please stand. <laughs> <laughs> Give Priya a very, very large round of applause. Okay, you can sit. Um, we are going to just have a quick conversation because I'd like to talk a little bit about what just happened in this room. Um, I hope you felt what I felt. Um, in a certain moment, the room changed and we were no longer strangers in a bookstore, but uh, we were together experiencing something uh, thanks to Priya and the work that you've done. Um, do you want to sit or do you want to stand? What feels most Easier to stand? So yeah, you can see I think us? so. Yeah. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, so Priya, I think the first thing that I'd love to ask you is, is to get actually a little bit into the overarching idea of what a group is. What's the fundamental idea of um, a gathering, three, three or more people? What makes it, what's important about it? What, what do we need to know about it? Yeah, thank you. So for me, the, I thought for a long time about how am I actually defining a gathering? Um, and people ask, is two people a gathering? And when you get together, and um, the line that I drew is a gathering is three or more people. 
And why I did that is because this book is about the life of groups. It's not about the life of pairs. And pairs have its own dynamics. And pairs exist in groups. So as we all sit here, there are married pairs. There are father and son pairs. There are friends pairs. But in a group, what I'm interested in is what actually happens when you add a third and a fourth and a 200th and a 500th. And, um, and, and I defined a gathering as such because I think every type of group is fascinating. And if you can start to understand the dynamics of groups, you can transform your gatherings. And um, when, I, you know, when I was starting to think about what transforms groups, the two things that it kind of comes down to, it's very simple and it's very complicated, um, is that all group life comes down to these two forces. And that is, how is a group going to deal with power and authority, the hierarchy, status, um, conflict, and how is a group going to deal with intimacy? How much of myself am I going to show? And all of group life, that this is Ed Shine's work from MIT, and he says that, different people say it in different ways, but all of group life is the balance and the dance between power, how are we going to be together, and intimacy, what am I going to show? I think that the two words that you just used, conflict and intimacy, are two things that I think that we uh, today are very familiar with in so many of the conversations that we're having uh, from the family level all the way to the political spectrum to the global spectrum. Um, this struggle of conflict and understanding who people are. Um, one of the things that you often talk about in your books is uh, this idea of risk. And w why do you think risk is important uh, in a group setting? Um, so, so risk is, is fundamental to transformation. Um, and again, one of the people that I most have learned from is, is Ida on this. She, she wrote her senior thesis, her um, dissertation on the role of risk in groups. And part of any time anytime people gather to basically not make it boring, <laughs> you want to talk about the things that matter. You want to start looking at the things that, um, that typically people for different reasons, sometimes good reasons, want to avoid. Um, and there are multiple characters in the room, and I'm so happy you're here. Um, and one of the things that I'll keep going, coming back to Ida is she has this beautiful question before every gathering that she designs, which is, what is the potential risk that we could face here? What is this group avoiding? Because there's power in what there's, they're avoiding. And if we were to face that, is it worth the gift? And, and basically trying to figure out, so for example, um, in a family reunion, and how many of you have been to a family reunion in the last year? And um, I'd just love to hear it out. What are, the, what are the topics, what are the taboos, what are the conflicts that you kind of aren't really sure you're dancing around or you're not really sure whether to face or not? And you just yell them out. Religion. Religion. Politics. Politics. And what specifically in your context? Specifically, who you voted for, what you support, big issues that are happening right now. Yeah. Who can relate to that? Politics. Can you repeat? Um, politics. Who did you vote for? How are you thinking about the country? things like that, the election. What are, what are some of the other areas of heat in your family at family reunions, controversy? The money. 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 Career. Career, what you're doing or what you're not doing, or what other people in your family are doing, and maybe you should be doing what they're doing. <laughs> and maybe you should really get out of this business entirely because you're not cut out for it. <laughs> That's my mom. <laughs> So one of the so family reunions, I'll just stick with this example. We think of them, the, our image of them are the, sort of these happy, well, I think at least in the culture, these sort of happy, fun, in the American context, kind of like Olympic games, you know, we're gonna run around and do lots of things together. And they're actually extremely, extremely loaded in a lot of different ways. And so part of what I look at is how do you actually create meaningful experiences that touch on heat, but aren't so specifically on the nose. And, and in the book I talk about um, to share, to whether it's a conversation or anything else, to sh ask people for their stories and their experiences rather than their opinions. Um, and so one of, in the book, one of my favorite examples is a guy, George Dawes Green. He founded The Moth. Um, and he uh, spoke about his family reunion. And he gathered 60 of his family members all around the country from like the niece who was six years old all the way to the 80-something-year-old you know, great-grandfather. And many of them hadn't met before. And so one night, they did all these different activities, but they wanted one moment of focus. Um, and so one night, they actually had a moth-style event for their family. And the theme was, what does it mean to be green? His last name's Green. 
And he said it was, and everybody from the seven-year-old to the 80-year-old got seven minutes to tell a story in their life of what it meant to them to be a green. And as he told it, he said it was the most spectacular experience because some of the stories I could relate to and some of the stories I thought, that is not what it means to be a green. And, and collectively, they had this kind of moment where they realized that actually our expansion and our definition of our family is many things. And they, and they could begin to think about what does it mean to be green as a cousin versus as a middle age versus as an older person and how are these values changing? But they didn't literally have that discussion. They had it through an experience. And so a big part of gatherings is basically thinking about how can you start to touch heat without blowing the, you know, melting the house down. Sorry about that. Um, so speaking of experiences, let's talk a little bit about tonight and what you did here. Um, you have a great chapter in your book that I love titled, uh, Never Start a Funeral with Logistics. Um, and it really talks about the importance of openings mm -hmm. and how you set people up um, for the event that they're, that they're participating in. So can you talk a little bit about what you did here and why, why it was important to do? Absolutely. So. Um, the number of times I now have friends text me from funerals saying, oh my gosh, they just started with logistics, um, is true. So <laughs> people tend to, because we want to kind of get the information, get the, the, the data out of the way, we tend to get on stage or come to a friend's house or start a meeting with kind of all of the, um, you know, where the parking is or where the, you know, where the microphone is. And the reason why that is unfortunate is because the opening and the closing is the most important moment that people actually remember from an experience. It's the moment you're welcoming people in, and then it's the moment you're tying it together and a peak experience. And so as, as you came here, when did this gathering, the gathering of the Strand tonight, when did it begin? Downstairs, Downstairs in the rain, when you got your champagne. When else? When I got your invitation. When, when Jen got my invitation. So when, when did you get, I'd love to hear from you, a few different people, when did you discover this event? How did you? Last night on the internet. And so what time was that? And how did you discover it? coming from New Jersey this morning and looking for something to do in New York and so I just googled you know something to do in New York and this came <laughs> <up>. <laughs> and, and that's why we're here whoever is doing the Google algorithm thank you <laughs> and one more one when somebody else how did you discover it yes uh, Going through with my group, so. Beautiful, thank you. And so, as you can hear, one more in the back. Uh, we are done for a podcast to my school and graduate student from the Master of Branding and SBA. And Debbie Millman had uh, done a lovely podcast with Mark Cohen, and I was very happy to be here. Awesome. And so, one of the things that's actually very complicated is that the gathering begins for different people at different times. And as a host, what you can think about is how do I want to host the journey from the moment of discovery to till the moment they walk through the door? And one of the things when you are thinking about a gathering is to think about how do you actually want people to show up? And so what is the invitation? And some of you got you know, different invitations. My friend Heidi texted me you know, a week ago saying, you didn't say in the invitation that you're doing an experience. We have to change the language. <laughs> and I thought, you're right. But all these other people think that we're doing something else, right? And so life kind of happens in between the moment of discovery to the moment of the, of the gathering. Um, and then once you got into the room, how did, how did we begin? What happened? I fumbled my opening. You what? I fumbled my opening. <laughs> <laughs> Only to you. But on and helped. How did we begin? It's in a circle. So first of all, whenever you can in any type of gathering, and particularly the ones where you didn't, don't think that you should sit this way, let people see each other. And one of the things that I did in the very beginning is I had you close your eyes and then I had you open your eyes and breathe and look around. And, one, and it sounds kind of obvious, but one of the biggest mistakes we make at our gatherings is we don't allow people permission to look at each other, to see each other, to just spend some time taking each other in. And when I work with activists particularly, I often spend a lot of time in circles because I literally say you can't build a movement if you don't know who's in it. 
And so as you think about, but you can do this at a dinner party, you can do this in a lot of small ways, but basically thinking about how do you actually connect your guests in a way that give them ways to connect with each other. So I also asked a lot of different questions and hopefully afterwards you can all follow up with the arrest story um, and the NYU you know, birth change name story and the, you know, the troublemakers and the smoother overs. But give your guests ways to actually then take their decisions to go. But you do all of this in the first 5% because when people walk in, when you're walking in, Everybody's thinking, what is this? Do I want to be here? Do I want, do I belong? Uh, can I be serious? Can I be jokey? Is this, you know, what's actually happening here? And the way you host that first 5% sets the path for the rest of the gathering. I, I want to open this up to the audience because you are part of this uh, and Priya has been so uh, generous to ask you a lot of questions. So what questions do you have for Priya? And again, please say your name and then ask the question. Hi, it's Bilal again. Um, my question is, why is this so hard when we have so little fear today than we did 100 years ago, than 1,000 years ago, it, uh, that we still walk with a sense of risk and fear, like everyone has their head down. Why is still, it still so hard? We have nothing to be afraid of. Why is it hard for you? I don't think it's hard, but I feel like I'm <laughs> over eager to engage and I get a sense of discomfort um, when I talk to people who, like my dad, for example, is the guy who talks about logistics every time. And when I try to go deeper with him, even through narrative, uh, he just kind of says, let's change the topic. Or then he says like, oh, I need to change the wiper blades or something random, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful question. And I think there's a thousand Re answers to it, one of which is there are some of the best therapists and psychoanalysts in the, in the world in this room, so you should talk to them afterwards. Um, but I think one of the things that I've realized as I, particularly as I did research, and one, I, I interviewed a hundred different gatherers from all over the world, circus soleil, choreographers, dominatrices, ra rabbis, people who create experiences in extreme ways for groups. But I also looked at a lot of old material around gatherings. I read Emily Post's books. I, I looked at you know, etiquette guides from the 1400s. And I, I tried to see like how and when did we think that gathering became about etiquette and flowers and what happened. And my best theory is that we, when we come together, there is, an, there is an anxiety, there is a discomfort. Not for everybody, and people have it at different layer, levels. And for whatever reason, for a long time, we harness and we focus that anxiety on the things of gathering. And we tend to basically, it, it can be scary and vulnerable to show oneself, and it can be even more scary to show, one, to show it in a group. So right now I'm talking, I'm creating an experience for each of you, but we're also having a collective experience. It's very, and you're also, you'll remember what I said differently. Um, and so the, the dynamic of a group is a very complicated thing. But I think one of the things that, you know, with your father, for example, um, there, it can be very scary to be seen. And it can be very scary to see. And the reason I wrote this book is because I want to help people find ways to create environments where you're willing to take a little bit more risk to be seen and to see. Thanks. <laughs> Priya, over here. Hang on one second. Priya, let me do the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. I have not yet looked at your book. I don't know if you address squarely a subject that interests me greatly. It is the power of humor to relax the dynamic of a group and release people from discomfort and awkwardness. And I'm curious to know how you think about it. You have used it this evening already, I think very productively. And because this is a setting in which you have encouraged personal engagement, I want to tell you that my niece, Kate Crontira, says hi. Aww. <laughs> I thought I recognized yeah. you. I officiated her niece's wedding. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful question, and humor is, you know, humor and comedians are a different way into the truth. And the best comedians basically tell truth, and we laugh. It's funny at some level because it's true. 
And I don't have a chapter particularly on humor. I try to weave it through, um, you know, through the context. And there actually there are some chapters that I specifically, this book is an eight chapter book and it began as a 12 chapter book. And many of those, the four kind of lost chapters, I tried to weave across and through and made it more implicitly as common themes. Um, but I will say that humor and, and silliness and playfulness is very important to relaxing people, in part because it's a different way of kind of um, rela you know, un uh, taking off masks. And I think the second thing I'll say is I do have a, a chapter on pop-up rules. So I talk about pop-up rules being the new etiquette and ways to playfully change people's behavior. In a multicultural world, we all were raised with a lot of different, you know, people are born in Ahmedabad, people are born in Paris, people are born in uh, Antwerp, people are born in Buenos Aires. And you have different etiquettes growing up that do not all match in the same way that you're going to gather. And so in the modern world, one of the trends I've been seeing and I think are, is awesome is the rise of pop-up rules that can be extraordinarily playful. So for example, um, having a networking night uh, where you're not allowed to talk about what you do. Um, or having a party, I had a, a 40th birthday party where everybody had to, the, the only rule was that, this actually came from um, Anthony Rocco, who is an incredible experience designer, and he uh, did this at a secret society in San Francisco and it's now spread, but the only rule was you can't pour yourself a drink. So implicitly you're getting people to pour each other drinks. Um, but basically having playful rules that allow people to kind of chuckle a bit and find ways through. But humor is a very, very important part of gatherings. Any more questions? Did you find any similarity in the way that a dominatrix gather and a rabbi do? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I think both, the, I think the best clergy um, are clergy, whether it's rabbis or um, imams or ministers, understand how to work with the shadow and understand how to work with confessionalism and understand how to work with the sides that we don't always want to show. And the dominatrix, the talented dominatrix is doing the same thing. And so as I, as I listened to different, one of the rabbis I in, in, uh, interviewed that was my most favorite conversation was um, Amikai La Lavi. And he was one of the chapters that was cut. So <laughs> that's like the secret chapter that maybe will come out later. And um, as I spent time with him, one of the things that he said and one of the reasons why he's such a, to me, provocative gatherer is because he is willing to transgress in the ways that he gathers. He's willing to step over lines. So the, the tagline of Lab Shul, which is an um, experimental Jewish community in New York, is um, everybody welcome, God optional. It's pretty radical. And I went to a Yom Kippur service there um, with Jack. Where's Jack? And um, basically, when you write a book, you get all of your friends to take you into their world. So I highly recommend um, going on these journeys. And I had this beautiful 24-hour experience where the man next to me um, was, uh, was Jewish, but self-proclaimed atheist. Um, and I am spiritual and complicated and believe in God. And both of us, for 24 hours, were basically moved and weeping and felt that we belonged. And to me, that he could create an environment like that was fantastic and fascinating. And to me, the best rabbis um, and the best dominatrices and the best people who understand that we all have complicated sides and it's okay to let a little bit of it out in safe environments are the people who can actually change the world. Other questions? There's a lot of hands. I was wondering, in the age of the Me Too movement, have you found that the dynamics, uh, how men and women relate to each other has changed group dynamics? <laughs> um, yes, uh, and it's fascinating. And to me, part of the conversation I'm most interested in in the Me Too movement, particularly in workplaces, um, is what to actually do with these men. The men, there's, and there's a lot, particularly in terms of, in terms of not the, you know, Charlie Roses or not the kind of the extreme examples, but people who are somewhere in between and we don't actually know how to, how to address an issue and then reintegrate them into a workplace. Right now, particularly in the West, we, we either imprison or we exile um, or we pretend nothing's wrong. And we have a very little um, spectrum 
for any type of other tools. And so one of the, th one of the best articles I've read about this was by a journalist in BuzzFeed. Um, I think it, the piece was in the Times, and she studied sexual assault, the sexual assault movement in cam college campuses in 2011. And one of the things that she said was, we either um, kind of exile these men um, or we don't do anything about it. And so she went and in, in interviewed some of the perpetrators and the quote that got me was um, a young man, he said, I did something wrong, I know I did something wrong, I regret it, I'm, I'm expelled from my school, I can't get a job, no one will give me anything, and I literally, I don't understand what you want me to do. Do you want me to kill myself? And to me, it was this kind of rupture, reading that piece, that it's a much more complicated question of how, it goes back to the dark side, how do we actually integrate the parts of us that we don't like to see? And it doesn't mean to not punish, and it does not mean to not um, stop the behavior, but this behavior is happening on a systemic level. So we have to actually add a little bit, ask a little bit underneath, why is this happening, and what are the conditions that allow this to happen? Um, and we, to me, the conversation right now has been too uh, blunt. Um, not blunt, what is it, if a, tr a tool is blunt? It's been too blunt, it's not sharp enough. And we have a lot more layers to continue to examine. Other questions? This might be the last, so I'm gonna have to, maybe two more. We'll choose, it's too hard to choose between you both. I just had a comment more than a question to make on humor, because one has to realize that humor is a two-edged sword. It can be used to wound as well as to heal. And uh, it has to be very judiciously used, especially in gatherings, because someone might be you know, using humor not uh, aware or be unwittingly hurting or you know injuring someone's feelings in a gathering. Uh, also, it's important to know the difference between laughing with someone and laughing at someone, especially in a gathering. So you know, it's nice to have humor as a heading, but it is a very dangerous tool to use unless it's very judiciously used. Mm -hmm. And, and I, what I'll just say about that is that is true for almost every element when people come together, whether it's humor, whether it's stories, whether it's language. We can hurt each other, and we can also heal each other. And I think part of the reason to your question earlier is this is hard and it's awkward when you really kind of get into authentic engagement, when you actually see each other. And I'm not saying for every dinner party you need to you know, dive into people's childhood traumas, um, but try it out. <laughs> um, but I am saying to kind of lower the water level a bit, because we're all so hungry for it, and there's playful, fun ways to start going about doing it, including in your workplace. And with all of these things, to hold it with safety, um, to hold it with honor, and to hold it to go back to Ida's, um, Ida's question is, what is the potential gift here, and is it worth the risk? And to be, hold that question you know, continuously. And, and by the way, I wrote this book not because I want everyone to be this perfect gatherer. I worth, wrote this book to welcome you to the mess of gatherings. Last question. Big pressure. Um, so you have mentioned a lot about kind of bigger group settings and when you are the host of something. But do you have tips on kind of building those relationships and meaningful relationships if you are a guest somewhere or in kind of smaller gatherings? It's an awesome question. Um, so I purposely wrote this book and we, I named it The Art of Gathering, not The Art of Hosting, because I think the, the kind of the underbelly, the wink in this book is that you can do a lot of these things as a guest. And you don't actually have to do all of these things every single time you host. This is actually just a, a book about group dynamics made very, very simple for the many types of gatherings in our lives. And so one of the things I would just say in terms of you know, small, intimate connections is um, ask questions uh, that are curious, that, that you actually don't know the answer to. Um, the second is to ask people for their stories and for their experiences, not for their opinions. Um, and the third is encourage what I like to call sprout speeches rather than stump speeches. So when you go to, it, it, you know, we all want to look good in front of one another. And so one of the things as a host is to figure out how to help people f know that you 
think well of them and kind of get beyond that so that we can kind of get into the real stuff. And so, and so one of the, my favorite um, gathering models is called 15 Toasts. And um, it's a process that Tim Lebrecht and I and my husband Anand kind of developed together. And you basically get, get together a group. It can be 15, but it can also be smaller. And you choose a theme um, like fear or um, borders or strangers or love. And the rules are you basically um, ding your glass at some point in the night and you stand up old school style and you give a toast by telling a story or an experience related to that theme. And the only rule is the last person has to sing their toast. <laughs> it speeds the night along. <laughs> at least in this culture. If you do it in India, everybody wants to sing, so it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, but I, um, but I think, and part of it is to try it out and email me, you know, send me what you experiment, send me how, most of the examples in the book come from delightful experiments that I've heard from other people. Um, and so I wrote this book in part to give you inspiration, not to literally do the same thing, but to listen to the principle behind it and test it out into your worlds. So please share with me, um, your experiences with it and, and, you know, share it with the world because I think to me, gathering is like water. We don't think about it. And I'm trying to write this book to help people pause and see that actually these things can be improved and we spend our life in gatherings. Speaking of sharing, I'm going to uh, go over a few logistics before we end. Um, <laughs> uh, this has been a wonderful gathering and uh, Priya has been so generous with us and so uh, if you have enjoyed the evening, please uh, photograph your book cover buy the book, uh, tell others about the book, post it on the internet if you are on social media. If you're not, just send a letter to a friend. Um, the hashtag is the art of gathering, um, and it really does help um, let people know about um, some of the lessons in this book, some of the lessons you've learned tonight if you recommend it. So I ask that you do. Um, also, because this is usually a traditional book reading, I thought that I'd end with reading a little excerpt of the book. Don't worry, it's not gonna be very long. Um, but I'm going to give you a taste of what this book is about by reading the chapter headings. If I can just get to them. She'll be faster. There, thank you. So, Priya, thank you so much. And the audience, thank you so much for being here with us. One, decide why you're really gathering. Two, close doors. Three, don't be a chill host. Four, create a temporary alternative world. Five, never start a funeral with logistics. Six, keep your best self out of my gathering. S <laughs> Seven, cause good controversy. Eight, accept that there is an end. Thank you. Thank you.